Welcome back. Last segment, we discussed medium Earth orbits and GPS satellites. So the next time you use your phone to figure out where you're going, I hope you think about the satellites in medium Earth orbit helping you get there. In this segment, we will continue moving outward from Earth and explore our last major orbital region, geosynchronous orbits. So geosynchronous orbits and a subset of these, geostationary orbits, are really cool and incredibly valuable. And to explain why, let's look again at Kepler's third law. A cubed equals P squared M. So the further you get from Earth, the longer it takes to complete a full orbit. And we confirm this in our calculations for both low and medium Earth orbit satellites. So low Earth orbit satellites were roughly 500 kilometers above the Earth's surface with orbital periods of an hour and a half. Medium Earth orbits were out at 20,000 kilometers from the Earth with orbital periods of 12 hours. And you can imagine heading further and further out from Earth, the orbital period will continue increasing. And so if we go way far out, we have another reference point. The moon. The moon is in orbit around the Earth. It's really, really far away, nearly 400,000 kilometers, so 10 times further than anything we've discussed before. How long does it take the moon to orbit? Roughly a month, right? 27, 28 days. OK, so low Earth orbit satellites take a little over an hour. The moon takes a little less than a month. There must be some distance in between, some value, at which the orbital period is exactly 24 hours. And if a satellite's orbital period is exactly the same as the Earth's rotation period, something amazing happens. So imagine the Earth rotating, and way out at this super special distance, satellites are orbiting at exactly the same rate. The satellite is exactly matching the Earth's rotation. If I'm sitting on the Earth looking up, from my perspective, the satellite would appear to hover in exactly the same point in the sky all of the time. It's not, but it would seem like that. So having a satellite in exactly the same point in the sky is super useful. So let's say I want to have an, a continuous, uninterrupted view of a particular part of Earth. I would need only a single satellite to do this. Or if we wanted a continuous communication link, we could point a receiver, like a satellite dish, towards one spot in the sky and never need to move it. So in order for a satellite to appear to sit perfectly in one spot, it needs to orbit exactly in the plane along the equator from Earth. These are called geostationary orbits. And coming back to the animation we've seen several times, geostationary orbits define this ring of satellites. If the orbit is off of this perfect ring, say in the ribbon near the ring, then the satellite is in geosynchronous orbit. A geosynchronous orbit will not appear to hover perfectly in the same spot in the sky, but it will trace out a smaller or larger region in the sky over 24 hours, depending on how far the orbit deviates from that geostationary ring. So to be clear, geostationary orbits are a special case of geosynchronous orbits. In both cases, the satellite needs to be orbiting in the same sense as the Earth. So orbits with the same orbital period as the Earth, but going in the opposite direction are possible, but they're not very interesting. If the Earth happened to rotate faster or slower, say one day was 27 hours or 22 hours, the distance from Earth to geosynchronous orbits would be larger or smaller. But one day is 24 hours. Actually, really, it's 23 hours, 56 minutes, and 4 seconds. And we can use this number in Kepler's law to determine the distance to geosynchronous orbits. So bringing up the equation again, we can solve for A, the semi-major axis, by putting in P, the orbital period of 24 hours, and the mass of the Earth. And again, we'll provide details of this calculation in the deeper dive. But spoiler alert, the answer is 35,786 kilometers from the Earth's surface. So nearly 36,000 kilometers from the Earth's surface. And remember when we talked about the Kármán line, so that definition where space begins, 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface? We noted it would take an hour to drive there. Well, geosynchronous orbits would take something like 14 days of continuous driving. And in fact, geosynchronous orbits are so far away that when communicating with these satellites, we actually need to worry about how long it takes light to travel back and forth. The round trip is about a quarter of a second. And while a quarter of a second seems pretty fast, you would totally notice that delay if you were like talking to somebody on the phone. 
We haven't even mentioned that geosynchronous orbits are within the outer Van Allen belts, so satellites also need to deal with all of this radiation. And yet, given all these issues, geosynchronous and especially geostationary orbits remain incredibly valuable and competitive places to put a satellite. Okay, so let's focus on the special case of geostationary orbits. The very first geostationary satellite was launched in 1964. Now, the very first artificial satellite at all, Sputnik, was launched to LEO in 1957, so this is just a few years later. This geostationary satellite was called SYNCON-3, and it was used for communications, specifically broadcasting TV signals, and it provided live television coverage to the U.S. of the 1964 Olympic Games held in Tokyo. And geostationary orbits remain incredibly valuable for TV signals today. So DirecTV, the DISH network, all those satellite dishes you see on people's houses, those are all communicating with satellites in geostationary orbits. Geostationary, geostationary orbits are key. In order to get TV signals, you need to be in constant communication with the transmitting satellite. And geostationary satellites remain in a fixed position in the sky, and so if I go and I put a satellite dish on my roof and I s install it in the right direction, it will always be pointed at that satellite no matter what time of day it is. And I don't have to change or fiddle anything. So a single satellite in geostationary orbit can cover a wide region of Earth. Overall, this is actually a pretty decent business model, right? So many of the satellites in geostationary orbit are these t telecommunication satellites. Each provider has its own set of satellites, and many different governments have different geostationary satellites for communication. There's also competition for these geostationary spots from satellites that want this continuous imaging of the entire Earth. And with as few as just three equally spaced satellites, geostationary orbits are far enough away that it's possible to get continuous coverage of the entire Earth. This is really useful for, say, weather monitoring or military surveillance. A specific example is the GOES network, G-O-E-S, of weather satellites. GOES stands for Geostationary Operational Environmental Satellite. And these satellites provide continuous imaging for all of North and South America. You can actually pull up real-time images from these satellites every five or 10 minutes. And if you looked at the weather forecast today, there's a pretty good chance that it relied in part on data from these GOES satellites. So given all the uses for geostationary satellites, a good question to ask is, how many satellites can we actually fit into this orbit? Geostationary is a single ring. So imagine like a bracelet around the Earth. Satellites are beads on this bracelet. And the question is, how closely can those beads be packed? Satellites are allocated slots in geostationary orbit by the International Telecommunication Union, or ITU. And it's ITU that decides how closely satellites can operate without interfering with each other. There are currently several hundred satellites packed into geostationary orbit. Given the demand for these orbits, when a satellite reaches the end of its lifetime, it's removed from that operational orbit. And the problem with geostationary orbits are it's so far away, deorbiting a satellite back to Earth isn't practical. And so instead, geostationary satellites are nudged into a more distant graveyard orbit. Current US guidelines require satellites to be moved at least 300 kilometers beyond more distant than the geostationary ring. And because they're further from Earth, this graveyard orbit has an orbital period longer than that desired 24 hours, so they're out of the way of that busy operational orbit below. This requires pre-planning in the form of an onboard rocket with some fuel left over at the end of the satellite's lifetime. So to close, let's come back to the original animation of objects orbiting the Earth. We now have a rough sense for the pros and cons of each of these regions. Next time, we will compare and contrast low Earth, medium Earth, and geosynchronous orbits, and talk about the number of satellites currently in each of these regions.